is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. I'm paying attention to mom and dad and stands. Is that a family that we want to have around and, and be with for the next four years? You have to look at all aspects of that stuff now and it affects your culture. It affects your team. And I think it's much easier to recruit culture than it is to try to mold culture. Cutlin Tab just completed his ninth season as the men's basketball head coach at Western New England University. Tab guided the Golden Bears to their first ever Commonwealth Coast Conference Championship game appearance in 2022-23 and a second place regular season finish in 23-24. Tab came to Western New England from the business world where he served as the president and owner of Basketball. Basketball is a basketball event management company, an official licensee of the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame that develops, promotes, organizes, and operates grassroots events, camps, tournaments, clinics, and skills academies throughout the Northeast. Tab previously served as an assistant on the men's basketball coaching staffs at Brandeis University and Rhode Island College for four seasons. As a player, Tab starred for Trinity College from 1999 to 2002, leading the program to a 51-20 overall record, a 2002 NCAA Division III men's basketball championship appearance, and a pair of New England Small School Athletic Conference runner-up tournament finishes. His best season came during his senior campaign when he poured in a school record 619 points on the way to becoming the program's first player selected to the National Association of Basketball Coaches All-America first team. After he graduated from Trinity in 2002, he played two years of professional basketball in Ireland and Germany. Tab was inducted into the New England Basketball Hall of Fame in August of 2015. Hey, Hoophead, save $3,500 on the Dr. Dish CT Plus and score free custom graphics during Dr. Dish Basketball's Push Beyond sales event. Shop this exclusive offer now until March 31st while supplies last. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Those are some great deals, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Matt Goldsmith, head men's basketball coach at the College of New Jersey, and you're listening to the Hoopheads podcast. Pro Skills Basketball is the nation's premier club basketball organization, building a European-style youth basketball academy, and is looking for the top basketball leaders in major U.S. cities to become our next city directors. Specifically, Pro Skills is looking for women and men of high character and grit who see the problems in youth basketball and want to join an elite team focused on a singular mission to change the culture of youth basketball. This job typically begins as a part time position with the desire and expectation from both the city director and Pro Skills that together they will build it up to eventually support a full time city director position. If you're interested in learning more or applying, please visit proskillsbasketball.com slash jobs prepare like the pros with the all-new fast draw and fast scout fast draw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years you'll quickly see why fast model sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there for a limited time fast model is offering hoop heads listeners 15 percent off fast draw and fast scout just use the code hhp15 at checkout to grab your discount and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. It's time to take some notes as you listen to this episode with Colin Tabb, men's basketball head coach, at Western New England University. Hello, and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host, Jason Sunkel, tonight. And we are pleased to welcome in, from Western New England University, the men's head basketball coach, Colin Tabb. Colin, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you guys having me on. Thrilled to have you on. Looking forward to diving into all the things that you've been able to do in your career. Let's start by going back in time, Colin, to when you were a kid. Tell us a little bit about some of your first experiences with the game, what you remember and what made you fall in love with it? Uh, geez. I mean, it's basketball has been, uh, you know, been a huge part of my life for as long as I can remember. Um, 
and it all it all starts with our family um my brother uh and then you know the two of us and then and then we have a bunch of cousins as well but all of their fathers who who are my uncles um had all you know there's about five uncles on my mom's side that all had uh some type of roots in basketball some were a little bit more football heavy um but but all of them were involved in basketball as well <clears throat> um Quite a few played at the college level. Uh, one played at Dartmouth. One played at uh, a Division three school outside of Springfield, uh, North Adams State. And then they, a bunch of them, got into coaching at various levels. Some really successful high school coaches, uh, some prep school coaches. So that you know, kind of growing up in that family, um, you know, just just had me around basketball from such an early age. And then my brother's three years older. And, um, his, you know, our cousin who, who is a very similar age to him, I grew up just idolizing those guys and, and trying to, trying to compete with them, trying to follow them around wherever <laughs> I could. Um, you know, like, I mean, I would, I would do anything to be around my brother and around my brother playing. So if that meant I was rebounding for him, that's what I was doing. You know, in our, in our backyard at the bottom of our hill, we had, a uh, my dad kind of converted, um, some space in the, you know, in the grass and made a, put down a, a paved, paved court. Um, so we had like, you know, nice, nice private, uh, hoop to work out in all the time. And, but I remember at such a young age, just rebounding for him. And, and like, I would, I, and I think that's when I really started to love the game is like, I would, you know, any missed shot that he had, I would, you know, go up and grab the ball or like, you know, as aggressively as I could, I jump as high as I could, <laughs> uh, you know, shot fake to put it back up and try to make, you know, try to get something out of it while I was missing, you know, any of the shots that he missed, which wasn't miss, wasn't many at all. Cause he could really, really shoot. Um, you know, so just being around him and, and, and kind of falling in love with the game that way. And then, you know, we had other cousins that were very, very good basketball players as well. Um, I think there's five or six of us that all played at the college level in our family. Um, so we had some battles growing up, um, you know, certainly my brother and I, but then our cousins, uh, extended as well. Um, so yeah, just, just kind of, you know, just being around it in our family. It just, um, just was something that was hard to avoid and hard to not love. The young age were you, because you had so many people in your family that played the game and coached the game was coaching on your radar from a young age, or was that something that you really didn't think about until your playing career was over? You know, it's hard to say. Um, and, and a lot of people have asked me that I, I don't, I don't think there's there's a part of me that, that ever thought I wouldn't be involved in basketball. Like I, I certainly had other interests, but like, I think those interests were, I don't want to say fleeting, but like, I just never, I never took them as seriously as I did basketball. Um, I don't know that I ever like at, at a young age envisioned myself as a coach, but like there were certainly, there, there were certainly aspects of how I viewed the game that was probably different than some of my teammates and peers and, and that kind of stuff. Like, you know, the, the, the system aspect of it, kind of dissecting the game, the scouting. Um, and then when my, when my brother got into coaching, like just the recruiting aspect and he was really, he's, you know, my brother's a, uh, been a college coach for a long time. He's actually coaching in prep school now, but um, kind of like that recruiting aspect of things, like building the relationships with players and like all that stuff, like started to feel really natural to me. Um, so, you know, it's hard to say like at a young age, if I was thinking about being a coach, I think, I wanted to pursue playing as much as I could and to see where that took me. Um, but definitely really didn't see myself not being involved in basketball some way, somehow. You got older and you kept competing with your brother and your cousins and just everybody in your family. When you got to high school and you think back to that time, how'd you go about getting better and improving your game? What were some of the things that you did? How'd you go about getting better to be the kind of player that you wanted to be? Um, yeah, I was pretty driven. You know, I, I, I think I, I think I made a lot of sacrifices. Obviously, you know, AAU was, was just starting to get really popular. Um, <clears throat> you know, it wasn't, certainly wasn't like it is now. It wasn't as, uh, you know, if watered down is the right word, but like it wasn't as prevalent, you know, like where every town city might have a team now, you know, <laughs> every single, every single kid who plays basketball plays could AAU. Play AAU, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, when, when, you know, when my brother was, was really getting into it, like there was probably four or five teams in Massachusetts at the time. And like every single one of them had multiple division one players on their team, you know? Um, and, and even when I, you know, three years later for me, when I was kind of getting into that high school circuit, like it, it was very similar. There were, you know, I was, I played more in Connecticut. We're, we're, we, where we live, it's, it, we're in Connecticut, but we're literally right on the Massachusetts state line. So like 
we crossed over between you know Springfield, Mass, or like kind of the Hartford, Connecticut area quite a bit with with how we played and who we played with. Um, so I I played more in Connecticut. Um, but that being said, like similar thing, like four or five, six teams at the most, and and all those teams were just really really good. Um, multiple college division one players on on the roster. So AAU for me was was part of like you know getting into it, but like. I definitely held myself to like, you know, I was very, very obsessive, you know, like anytime I wasn't feeling good about myself as a player, like I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm outside of my hoop, you know? And, and I was, I was very diligent about like, you know, making sure that I felt better about how I was performing. And like the only way to correct that was to go back out and work, you know? Um, we were like with, with a lot of my high school teammates, like we organized runs all the time at our town park, um, and we had a good group of guys that would that would consistently play. Like we, I, I couldn't just think of like hours at the park in the summer, you know, just like spending entire days there. Mom and dad dropping us off early in the morning, and like we would literally bring bring lunch with us and just spend all day there. Um, we hunted games too. Like we would drive into cities to find places to play. You know, we would drive into Hartford, we'd drive to New Britain, we'd go into Springfield, and all those places are like 30, 35 minutes away. But you know, like we would go seek seek out higher level competition. And like, you know, kind of walk in like, who the hell are these dudes? And then knowing that we had had something to prove, you know, and like, and then a game later, they're like, okay, these dudes can play and we would spend hours (laughs) there, you know? And there was something to that. Like there was that like, you know, kind of gave you like a little bit of confidence, a little bit of, uh, you know, just like motivation to go out there and kind of prove that you belonged. Um, So I think there was just like, there was just that aspect of just being driven to like get better, to challenge myself, to, to find the best competition I could find. Um... You know, and, 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 but there was also like that self motivation, like I talked about. Like I was, I was constantly, constantly scrutinizing myself and, and, and probably being my, my own toughest critic. So, how does the pickup basketball scene that you grew up with and the way you described it, that's the way I grew up too. And I talked to so many coaches and just seeing it with my own two eyes that that pickup basketball culture that you described just doesn't exist anymore. And so, nope. When you think about how your players that you're coaching today, how they get better, what they do with their off season, just compare and contrast what you did versus what they're doing now. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it's, it's definitely different now. Um, like my guy, my guys at Western New England in the off season, like they are playing pickup, like they organize, you know, probably four to five days a week, you know, they're in the gym playing pickup with each other. Um, but I, 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 you know, I think it's easy and it's convenient in a, in a certain way because, you know, you, you know, you have probably 12 to 14 guys that, that are probably returning or guys that still want to play, you know, even some of the graduates that are, that still want to play. Um, but like, you know, it's, you're not, you're not going, you're not going to the park down the road or driving to a park and, and trying to find some run like where I, I just don't think that exists much anymore. Um, and it's kind of like, to me, like that, that's where, like, I don't know, like you, you earn like, you earn your stripes a little bit doing that. Like you, you figure things out doing that. You, 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 you're challenged in way like you're, you're, you're complaining, you're, you're competing against all sorts of different types of talent. So, so a lot of guys older than you, a lot of guys way bigger and more physical than you. Um, guys that are quicker, more athletic, like, and you have to, you have to improvise. You have to figure out how to compete at that level. You have to sometimes be smarter. You have to sometimes be stronger. Um, you have to be tougher. You got to stay on the, you got to find a way to stay on the court, you know? So like, I don't know. There's a lot, like, I just don't, so many kids nowadays, especially at like the high school level, you know, they have a personal trainer, they, or they only want to work out with somebody that's, that's putting them through a workout and telling them what to do. You look, you lose some of that creativity and some of that, like, I don't know, just like that pureness of the game um, when you're doing that. And I don't know how well all of that stuff translates. Um, I mean, there's definitely, you definitely improve as a player, you're improving your skill set, but like how much of that is like game applicable, you know? And, and that's, that's the, like, cause when you're playing at the park, like you're, you're finding ways to win, <laughs> you know, like you, you want to stay on the court. So you're, right. fi- you're finding Absolutely. ways to win. Uh, you're, you're, those are two different things. Like <laughs> finding a way to win as a player is much different than being able to take six, seven, eight dribbles and break somebody down and take a shot. That's right. not a great team shot, you know? Yep. Um, absolutely. So I don't know, like the, 
it's just a different it's just a different generation with some of that stuff and and i and i wish i wish like you know high school kids and college kids would go seek that stuff and and just play just play ball and like get beat up get get some cuts get some get some blood like that's what it's all about you know and um yeah i just think some of that stuff's missing nowadays i can sense your exasperation and <laughs> i feel the ex- i feel the exact i feel the exact same way and this is a conversation that we've had I don't even know how many times on the podcast that I always lament the disappearance of pickup basketball. And my son's a senior in high school this year, and he just didn't grow up in the game the same way that I did. And I tell people all the time that I played high school basketball, I played Division One college basketball, and some of my best memories of the game are not from those organized team experiences. They're just from playing at the park with different dudes like you described that, mm-hmm. Hey, this guy's here. I drove to this court or we played in this gym. Or I remember when we took this five and showed up and nobody thought we were going to be any good and boom, all of a sudden we're winning. And then you got gather guys respect. And I don't know how you can measure Colin, the difference in player development, because when you look at the isolated skill level of players, I think there's no doubt that shooting today is better than it's ever been. Yeah. The number of kids that can handle the ball is better than it's ever been. But I think you made a great point of it's one thing to be able to shoot the ball or be able to handle the ball, but how do you figure out how to win games? And I don't know if that's basketball IQ. I don't know if that's competitiveness. I'm not sure what exactly it is. And I know there's no good way for us to be able to measure like, hey, put this kid in this environment and then put that same exact kid in this other environment and let those two kids develop simultaneously and yeah, right. see which one comes out better. I know we can't do that, but I just know, and again, I think you feel the same way. And somebody who grows up in today's world probably thinks that their way is superior. And certainly I'll go to my grave thinking that the way that I grew up in the game is superior. I just think that we have to accept that it's different. But I do oftentimes wonder what have we gained versus what have we lost? And I Mm -hmm. think one of the big things for me is just pick up basketball more than anything else just was so much fun. And I think that's what fostered my love for the game. And it sounds like you were exactly the same way. Yeah, no question. No question. I mean, I loved it. I loved it. And, and I, you know, I miss those days. So like, I don't, I don't play a whole lot anymore at all, really. Um, and, and my body just can't handle it, but like, I miss those days. And I think there's, there's, that's, that's how, that's how people truly love the game, you know, like that competitiveness and that, yep. that, that, that just finding a way to win. And, you know, you, and you kind of, you know, a lot of times you're doing with some of your boys, you know, and, and, yep. you know, stuff like it, man. No, you're building that camaraderie and stuff. And, you know, it's funny. I, I, I have, I have three girls and I, and I brought my middle daughter out. I don't know. It was probably like six months ago. I brought her, um, just outside in our, in our driveway and we we're working out and, and, uh, and I started like, you know, getting a little more physical with her than she's used to. And she's like, right. you know, right. she's, she's like, dad, like, what are you, why are you doing that? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you gotta be able to play. You gotta be able to play through contact. You gotta be able to play through physicality. Right. And like, and I could tell like, like she was very <laughs> apprehensive. Like she was nervous, you know? And like, I'm like, look, yeah. like, th- this is, this is how you need to adjust now. Like this, you know, I'm, I'm giving you a bump. I'm giving you a check. Like you gotta, you gotta be the one that initiates the contact. Like don't, don't respond to the defender initiating contact. Like you as the offensive player, you need to be the one to initiate. So anyhow, we kind of went through like, you know, a 20 minute workout of that side of it. Like, you know, her driving and, and getting into me and creating the contact and all that stuff. And then, you know, the very next day she sent me a text on her way home from school. And she's like, dad, can we do that workout again? And I was like, this is awesome. Like, yeah, there you, you know, go. she, she's, she's now she, like I, she started thinking about it and it, it kind of like, you know, there was a little bit so, something like, you know, the, she kind of, kind of like bit, you know, got, got that, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like just kind of got her, um, you know, got, got the got, juices flowing. Got the juices flowing. Yeah. Like just kind of, you know, like just got her thinking and got her, got her wanting more. Like she got the bug a little bit. The, that's the word I was looking for. She got the bug. And, and, and the fact that she wanted more of that was awesome. So like we've, you know, we've done that a bunch since and like she's become a tougher player because of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of cool to see some of that, but like, you know, again, like I, you can do one of th- two things. You can just, you know, put her through drills and, and rebound for her and, and walk, talk to talk about her skills. But like, again, like what's going to translate more and like, she's got to get stronger and tougher and be able to play through contact. And, you know, like you said, there's all elements of the game that, that, um, that's hard to measure, like what's more beneficial and what's not. But like, you know, I, I certainly there. It's it's all, all about being more as well rounded as you can be, and and having as many different experiences as you can. Absolutely. All right. What's your biggest challenge as a basketball parent? 
Oof, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, there's a lot of times where they don't want to hear it, right? So, um, you know, I try, I try not, I'm not that, I'm not that father that's in the stands barking at them. Um, you know, I, I let them play. I want them to, I want them to ask me to go work out. You know, like I don't say like, Hey, you like, let's go get a workout in because you haven't done anything yet today. Um, but it's a fine line, right? Because technology is yep. just constantly at their fingertips and they, they, they always have distractions. They always have reasons why they shouldn't, you know, or why they don't want to go out and do something or work on their game or whatever. Um, so I think it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's knowing how much to push them, knowing how much, um, that they, they understand how hard they should be working in order to be a good player. Um, whether it's, you know, and, and I have, you know, in my oldest ones more like lacrosse and, and then my two younger ones are soccer basketball right now. And so, you know, and they're at the age now where, especially my middle one where, you know, it's time for her to like, you know, figure out if she's serious about it and, and really be committed to it if she wants to be and, and put more time into getting better. Um, but I think the, the biggest challenge, um, is knowing like how much kind of constructive criticism to give them, you know, um, and when they want to hear it, when they don't, um, I, I try not to say a ton right after the game. I try to like, give it some time, get back in the house. We'll talk a little bit. We'll hang out and they're like, Hey, you know, like, do you remember this play or, you know, try to bring it up a little bit later. And cause I think they're usually a little less emotional at that point And they're a little more receptive to, to hearing what I have to say. Um, you know, but there's definitely like. They, they like to roll their eyes at me and, and, you know, say, oh, geez, here goes dad again. Like dad's the coach. He wants, to talk, he wants to talk to me about it. So, you know, I gotta, I gotta try to pick and choose when it's appropriate when it's not. It's funny. Cause that's a fine line to walk. Yeah. It's funny. Cause today I, I actually went over to my, uh, my fourth grader. Um, they have a playoff game on Saturday. So the coach said something to me about, you know, stopping in and like, we're going to see a zone this weekend. Like, do you think you could stop in and, and give us some tidbits? So I didn't tell her I was coming. So I got there with like 45 minutes left in practice and I, and I walked in and, and I see her look at me and she's like kind of rolling her eyes. Like, what are you doing here? And then the coach is like, you know, we have a special guest, uh, coach tabs going to talk to us about, you know, some stuff that we can do and, and look for against his own. And so like all the other girls were like, Oh, like co a college coach is here. This is great. Like we can, right. we're going to learn something different. And, and then she's just like, kind of, she's more embarrassed, you know? So, right. <laughs> It was, uh, it was, it was, it was good. That's she, funny. She settled in. She That's settled funny. In. That's the life of a parent right yeah, there. That is sure. a very apt description of the life of a parent. No doubt. Walking that line is tough. How much do you push versus how much do you make sure it's on them? And yeah. it, there's a fine line there where you can, you can tread on one side of the line a little too far and you can <clears> certainly <throat> tread on the other side a little bit too far. And that's, I think one of the biggest challenges, especially if you're somebody who again, had such a good experience in the game and you're competitive and you kind of know what it takes and you want to be able to share that knowledge with them. And yet to your point, there are times where they just want to roll their eyes that year. They just are like, Hey, I don't want to do it today. And sometimes I guess I found for me that even though it was really, really hard, I had to step back and just say, Hey, it's got to come to them. And for me, that's been, that's been successful because I think eventually the kids came around to the game and then I also didn't damage my, damage my relationship with them, which ultimately is the most important thing that 20 years from now, they still, still want to talk to their dad. And they were not like dad was an overbearing ogre who just made me practice basketball at the time. So right, right. it's not easy to do. It's, it's not, definitely, definitely not easy to do. It's not. And, and when you're living in the moment, you feel like time's ticking, you know, like you got, you like, you right. got to start working, yep. you got to start working. But like, I, I look back yep. and, I, and I know like my, m when I really like dove into like just being fully committed to basketball, it was probably, you know, like eighth grade going into freshman year. And then, you know, yep. and, and, it, yep. and, it, and it was pretty consistent, but like, you know, there was other times where I was just like, you know, super, super committed to like being the best I could be. And then there was other times where it kind of ebbed and flowed a little bit, you know? Um, so yep. you got you got our memory, plus our memory is probably a little clouded, right? For mine is some, for sure. So it's some, it's some, <laughs> it's some, it's to, to some degree, but mine is um, for sure. All right. So tell me a little bit about your college decision. Yeah. So I actually started at Quinnipiac. I was at Quinnipiac for two years. Um, my friend, my freshman year, I had knee surgery. Um, I played for Joe DeSantis there. I'm not sure if uh, if you guys know Joe at all. Um, really good player at Fairfield, and then he had uh, he had been in college in college coaching for a while. I think at like St. John's and Pitt, and then he got the Quinnipiac job. And we had just gone Division One, um, so you know I, I, I visited there and I loved it. Um, I had knee surgery my freshman year, so I did not play at all. Um, and then my second year, redshirt freshman year, I, I played quite a bit uh, as a redshirt freshman. Um, played well. Um, I, I won't get into all the details, but let's just say 
there was, there was a, there was a very stubborn side of me that, you know, coach and I had like a little exchange and, and I, and I don't, you know, I, I don't think either side of us were really happy with the exchange, but there's a part of me that said, okay, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm decided I'm going to look somewhere else and transfer. And then, you know, he was kind of shocked by that decision. Um, so long story short, I ended up, I did end up transferring. Um, and there's always like a, a side of me that has a little bit of regret for that decision. Um, but that being said, like, my experience at Trinity was, was just awesome. And, you know, I'll, n- I'll never have regret for going to Trinity. You kind of always, have, always wonder about like, had I stayed at Quinnipiac, what would have happened? Cause you know, again, I, like I, I did feel like I was playing well and I was getting good minutes. Um, but when I transferred to Trinity, like I just really fell back in love with the game. Um, and I was amazed at, at how competitive it was like going from division one to division three, I thought there was going to be, it was going to be a lot easier, you know, and, and I'd walk in and, you know, it was going to, going to be a cakewalk, like you know, division one player going down. And I was just blown away at how right. good it was, you know, like maybe they're not as big and as athletic, but like these dudes could play like the skill set was there. Yeah. Like they knew how to play the game the right way. Um, and it was actually, um, I was looking at a couple schools when I was transferring, but I, I had known coach Ogronnik, um, a little bit during my high school days, he recruited me a tiny bit, but it didn't, it didn't really um, translate to much. And then I had a buddy of mine that was at Trinity from high school. Um, and then my, my previous assistant coach from high school was now an assistant coach at Trinity, kind of like a volunteer assistant. So he's the one that like kind of connected me with, with coach O'Ronick and, and kind of opened up that door. And then, um, you know, so it was, tr- uh, Trinity is a really good academic school. <clears throat> and, um, I, I was doing well at Quinnipiac, but, second semester I knew I like needed to get my GPA up to a certain like whatever that number was. I think I, I think I had like a low three, two, three, three, and I needed to get over a three, five to be able to cons- be considered at, at, uh, at Trinity. So like I had to really bust my butt second semester, uh, at Quinnipiac to get my GPA a little bit higher, get over three, to get over a three, five. And then fortunate enough to, uh, to get in there. And then, yeah. So then, you know, three years at Trinity and, and had an awesome experience. So what were you thinking career wise at that point? <clears throat> Yeah, at that point, like I, there, there, there was a side of me that was like, you know, my, like my grandfather was in was in uh, law enforcement. He was um, chief of police in Springfield for for a number of years, and his nick. So we'll probably talk about it later. But the company that I started uh, that has a partnership with the Hall of Fame is called Basket Bull. Um, my grandfather's nickname was the Bull. So, um, like tough, tough dude. He actually played at Providence College, um, played basketball at Providence, and everyone called him the Bull. Um, so. When I was at Trinity, I was doing a bunch of stuff like legal studies. Um, I was doing political science uh, as my major and legal studies as my minor. And I was really thinking about like maybe doing something in in law, whether it was law enforcement or, you know, or maybe something, you know, maybe potentially go go to law school. Um, so that's where my area of study was. But like, you know, again, like I, I was I was loving every aspect of basketball there, too. Um, so, you know, there was a side of me that was like, okay, this is what I'm going to get my degree in and maybe pursue this career path. But, you know, I was still, still obviously, you know, really loving everything about basketball. So I I knew I want to kind of try to continue to play and and see where that led to. So when you graduate, you get an opportunity to play overseas and you go to Ireland and to Germany. Tell me a little bit about those two experiences, what it was like as a young guy going overseas and playing and kind of being on your own. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was tough. It was eye opening. It was, um, certain, some, some aspects very professional, some aspects, you know, a little, um, disor- unorganized and, you know, of course, it, 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 it kind of got the full gamut of, of, of the, uh, international playing overseas experience. Um, so I started in Germany, um, very blue collar town, um, not a lot of English spoken there. Um, that was an adjustment, um, the league was extremely, extremely competitive. I mean, multiple like division one, you know, big East ACC level guys. There's, um, I'm there like, I, you know, Brian Brown played at Ohio state, Terrence Wrencher, uh, played at Texas. I mean, there was a lot of very, very good players that were in the league. Um, and then a ton of really good international players. And we're going, you know, we're going to from arenas that had 2000 people to 10, 15,000 people. Um, so just like the, the basketball was high level. Um, it was professional and, the experience, like, you know, it was tough, but I kind of settled in and, um, I was playing well early on and I was starting and, and getting good minutes. And then I, uh, I had a really bad ankle injury. Um, I dislocated my ankle bone chips, um, 
you know, just, it, it was, it was bad, probably tore like three, three ligaments in it. So I was out for like three months and, and they were great. The, the club was awesome. They, they continued to honor my contract. Um, but they ended up bringing in another player. Um, I think he played at, I want to say Mississippi state. Um, can't remember his, his name is Chuck something, but anyhow, he, um, so when I did finally get healthy, which was like in December, I think, I think I toured in like early October, um, got healthy in December. And then like a lot of my minutes were kind of gone at that point. So I was, you know, I, I, I kind of played some sporadic minutes here and there. Um, and then, then I, you know, season finished up, came back and I re-injured the ankle again. So then I ended up coaching at Rhode Island college for a year just cause I was like, the ankle was not feeling great. And I wasn't sure if I was gonna be able to make it back over overseas in time to try to play another year for like that August. So I ended up coaching at Rick for a year. Um, and then throughout that year, I was kind of like getting the bug to try to get back overseas. So um, started training again, started working out again. And that's when I went to Ireland. Um, and I was, I actually went to England first. Um, when I got to England, everything that was promised for me, it was, so it was a team in the BBC, uh, BBL, excuse me, everything that was promised for me, car, apartment, all that stuff. None of it was, was given. None of it was provided. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm, I'm like waiting at the airport for like four hours waiting for somebody to pick me up when I first arrived. Um, you know, and then I get there and I'm living with like five other guys and it's like, it's, it's all, it's almost like a dorm, a dorm suite. It's like, you know, there's, there's one little kitchen area and then everyone's got their own bedroom off of it. Um, and actually everybody had roommates too. Like it was just, it was, it was bizarre. Um, but they had promised me my own, my own apartment, my own car. I didn't have a car. So that lasted about two weeks. I could tell it was just like a shady situation. Um, so then I ended up going f right from England to Ireland. And, um, so then I played there that year and, that was a cool experience, uh, experience, but it was just, it was just so much less professional. Like we only practiced three days a week. Um, you know, it was the, the pay was nowhere near the same. Um, my wife now, but my, she was my girlfriend at the time. Like she came over and spent a lot of time with me over there. And she's like, do you really want to keep doing this? And I'm, you know, part of me, part of me did, but then at the same time, I'm like, look, I'm right, not, I understand. Yeah. I'm not going to keep playing for the rest of my life. So I, I think at some point, like I, you know, I could probably hang them up. And so, it was kind of at the, towards the end of that situation that I was like, all right, maybe I'll, maybe I'll stop playing. And, um, and then came back and got a job for a little bit. And then the, the Brandeis job opened up. So I was able to get, um, a coaching job, uh, at, which was a really good coaching job at that time. Cause it was, it was a full-time position, uh, paid pretty well. And then, and obviously in a great, great league. Um, so that was my first step into coaching, um, for that Oh five year. So I was the next year after, after playing in Ireland. So. Hey coaches, excited to talk about Coach's Mirror from Teams of Men. It's a game changer for your team's film analysis, blending Kip Ione's coaching expertise with AI. Short on time or staff, this is for you. Send in a game or up to five and get back a detailed report. We're talking tendencies, strategies, even what opponents might use against you. It's like finding the other team's scouting report in your gym. And here's a bonus. Intrigued by AI and scouting? Grab our free 10 prompt PDF sheet at teamsofmenmembership.group slash coach mirror. It's a quick download and a great start to revolutionizing your season review. Don't miss out, coaches. Head to our site and see how Coaches Mirror can transform your game analysis. Catch you there. Hey, coach. Want to take your team to the next level this season? Introducing Game Changer the ultimate game day assistant with tools to give you a winning advantage. With Game Changer, you can track stats, keep score, and even live stream games, all for free. Get the stats and crucial game video you need to lead your team to victory, all from the palm of your hand. Coach smarter this season with Game Changer. Download Game Changer today on iOS or Android and make this season one to remember. Game Changer. Stream. Score. Connect. Learn more at gc.com slash hoopheads. That's gc.com slash hoopheads. So in those two experiences at Rhode Island College and then at Brandeis, uh, how, what did you know immediately that you liked about coaching? What was it that said, hey, this is something that you know I can see myself doing? I mean, I think, I think there's a lot of aspects of it that I, that I just, <clears throat> that I really enjoyed, especially, especially back then, like the, there were two very different situations. Um, you know, at Rhode Island College, I was learning a ton, um, working for a guy that was that was very demanding, and and um, you know, of of the staff, of his players, just he ran it like a Division One program. Um, 
but it was, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I, and I enjoyed the, the competitiveness of it. I enjoyed the preparation of it and, and scouting opponents and the recruiting aspect of things and trying to find, you know, those, those next guys that can, you know, get the program to the, to the level that you want it to be at. Um, and then when I was at Brandeis, he, he, get, the, the head coach there gave me a, a ton of autonomy to, to, you know, kind of, you know, just give my ideas and provide my feedback and, and, and take leads on scouts and take leads on recruiting. And, you know, he, he was a, he was a really smart coach and he did a great job of, um, of closing with recruits and, you know, and kind of big picture stuff, but he gave his assistants a lot of autonomy to, to learn and grow and, and kind of take ownership and what, and, and aspects of the, of the program that he thought they could handle. Um, so I love that aspect of it too. And it just like, just really kind of, you know, gave me a, a lot of like just pride and, and passion to try to, to try to build up uh, the Brandeis program as good as we could. And, you know, we had some really successful years there. Um, the league was, was super competitive. Um, and, and I just, I just, re- that's when I like really fell in love with like the coaching aspect of it. I, 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 and I, and I think at that time I was starting to think like, uh, I'd love to have my own job one day too, you know, be a, be a head coach one day. So how do you go from that to basketball? Yeah. So <clears throat> the basketball thing kind of popped up like we, so it, it kind of goes full circle now back to a lot of my uncles that were very involved in, in coaching and, and playing when they were younger and then, and then coaching when they got older. And so they, um, they had a really good relationship with people at the hall of fame and, and the hall of fame was, was, um, very interested in trying to start up youth basketball events, um, in, in hopes of, you know, bringing people to visit the museum and, kind of build their, their brand in that, in that market, in that landscape. And, um, so they approached my uncles about, Hey, like, would you guys have any, any interest in possibly starting up some, you know, a tournament series with the hall of fame, uh, brand and logo and, um, we'll have a partnership. So <clears throat> we were doing it for, you know, probably like the whole time I was at Brandeis, I think we had started up cause I think we started in about 2004, 2005. So, um, and, and I, I took a, I, I took a liking to that too. Like there was a side of me that like really, you know, I think it's probably just the competitive side, like just trying to build up these tournaments and make them as, as successful as they could be and get some of the better teams there. And, um, and I thought it was, there was a lot of synergy between the recruiting aspect of things and, and building relationships with the AAU guys that could help with recruiting. And, um, so, so we were doing it for a few years and then we had an investor, um, that wanted to build a multi-court facility in Springfield. And he kind of, he kind of had like the same vision and model as the Cooperstown field of dreams for baseball. He wanted to, you know, have all these basketball courts in, in the city and, um, and be able to run all these tournaments and have, you know, the hall of fame connection. And so it made a lot of sense to me. And, and he offered to make my position a full-time position. And it was a significant salary increase for me. Um, it got me back into, you know, the Springfield area where my family is from and, so at that time, like it was hard for me, but I, I guess I just felt like, you know, I, I had to take the opportunity when it was there. And just, I think from a financial standpoint, and, and there was a, there was a side of me that really enjoyed putting the events on. Um, so that's when I left coaching. And I think probably a month later, I was like, geez, I'm going to miss coaching. You know, like I, I could tell right away. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like, this was also kind of cool and it kept me in the game and it kept me in the game in a way that I thought, you know, maybe I could use it and leverage it down the road to potentially, um, you know, get back into college coaching and whether that was an assistant job or, or a head job, because I, that was the one thing, um, that, that I did was like, I had a lot of relationships and contacts with a lot of people in the AAU world and the prep school world. And, um, you know, you, you had to, you had to talk to these guys all the time. And, and I was able to make a lot of good friendships and good connections and people that I really like and trust and, and truthfully still stay in touch with to this day. Um, you know, whether it's recruiting or, or, you know, we're still running basketball, obviously not to the same degree. Um, but I still run those events on the, on the side during the spring and summer. Um, so I did that for full time for about five or six years. And the, the business grew, like we went from, you know, probably four or five events a year up to like over 20 events, you know, in probably like 2012, 13, 14, some in those years. And we, and we had some of the best, um, recruiting exposure events, like in the country, like we were competing with all the top, um, event operators, the hoop group and, and, you know, big shots and Bigfoot and all, all the guys that are running some of these best, you know, some of these premier events that are not shoe company events. Um, and the shoe company circuit kind of changed the landscape, um, when they really started to push that stuff. 
because they kind of gobbled up all of those live weekends where you can run events. <clears throat> so I think there, there was kind of like a gradual decrease in the quality of our, our Hall of Fame branded events, um, kind of like in the late, you know, 2015, 16, 17 in those years. Um, but, uh, you know, we had some really good years where our, where our events were like very, very high level. And we had, I mean, there was a couple of years where we probably had 200 college coaches that came to some of our, some of our top events. So, um, there was, I took a lot of pride into it, you know, and, and I wanted those things to be really well run, wanted them to be competitive. And I was, I wanted to get some of the best, best clubs and players that we could get there. So I think it was just that competitive side of me that wanted to, you know, put a product out there that was, that was really successful. From a business standpoint, in between events, did you try to fill that building and how challenging was that? So, so the building never ended up happening. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So, and I didn't, I didn't say that as part of the story. So the investor, you know, we probably had over a year to a year and a half where he was very involved and wanted to build it. And, you know, eventually he got to the point where he just didn't think it made financial sense. So whether that was a year, year and a half, whatever it was. Um, but at that point, like we were running a pretty, pretty solid business, you know, like we had good revenue. We had, you know, we, had, we, we were smart about our expenses and, you know, we had some other full-time people with me as well, but like we, you know, we, we were, we were, we were making a profit and doing pretty well. And, um, and we didn't have the facility at the time. So like, so one of my uncles said, you know what, like, why don't we buy it? Cause he, when he invested into, into myself and, and the company, like he, he bought ownership in the company. So, um, when we were trying to get it back, we decided to offer him, you know, a, a buy a, to, to basically purchase the company back from him. And we were able to do that. And then, you know, then kind of just run it as our own business and, and we had full ownership in it. So probably was a good move not to buy a building based on my experience of talking to people. <laughs> no, I question. think the build, the building, the building business is a tough business. I will say that you can probably make it work, but if I had money to invest, I think there are other places that I would put my money that would have a better return. Now, if I had lots and lots and lots of money and I just wanted to do it for fun, maybe. But if I was looking at it as a as an investment that was going to make money, man, owning a building is that's a lot of hustle to be able to keep that thing full, which is kind of why I asked you that question because I know that people that I've talked to and been around that have a building you got to be hustling all the time to keep that thing full yeah no, no question and I, and I same thing i talked to a lot of people um whether it was during those years when we were really um you know thinking about that idea and that concept or since then like the the the, the under the underlining theme is that the you don't own the building the building owns you and you're you're constantly trying to figure out ways to bring people in to to, to provide revenue to cover your monthly expenses and it's just, it's just, you know, it's, it's almost impossible. Um, and it never, and it never stops. It you can't never relax. Stops. You can't never, stops. never relax. Yep. And, and I like, I was adamant about like, I'll never, I never want to be somebody that owns it. I never want to be somebody that runs the building. Like I will run all of my events out of the building, but like, you're going to have to yep. get somebody else to manage it. You're going to have to get somebody else to, to, you know, to just oversee that thing day to day, you know? So for sure. That's definitely the right track. Yeah, no question. Yep. So, all right, talk about getting back into coaching. You jump back in and you get into uh, coaching at the boarding school yep. at Loomis Chaffee in Connecticut, and then that'll going to kind of jump you over to to Western New England. So, just give me the rundown of how that happens and and how you end up at Western New England, and then we'll we'll dive into building your program there. Yeah, so so L the Loomis thing was was kind of kind of a, a cool story. Um, I had I had known the AD through through basketball and running those events, and we had we had um, I think we ran one or two events there, but we had been in contact a bunch, and he reached out to me, and it was like probably late October, early November um, of 2014, and they had they had literally just started practice, and they were like a week into practice, so whatever that time frame was, and he goes, hey, we just had a situation where our, our coach um, decided to leave. Uh, he's like, I'm not going to get into the details of why, but we're looking to find somebody to fill his spot. Would you know anybody? And I'm like, you know, let me think about it. Like uh, I can ask around, like, you know, obviously short notice, the timing isn't great, but, and we're talking for like 10 minutes or so. And then we're about to hang up. And, and I say to him, I'm like, Hey Bob, like, I'm just throwing this out there, but you know, I know you're looking for somebody for the job. Like, I, like I might have an interest in it. And he's like, let's, let's, <laughs> he's like, let's, let's grab coffee tomorrow. <laughs> so 
So, oh, so you know, what? I know exactly what it was because my wife and I were on our way to um, my in laws, so her family for for uh, Thanksgiving in Rhode Island. So we stopped. It must have been like probably that like Wednesday morning or whatever it was. So it was probably Thanksgiving week. So we stopped and had co- I had coffee with with the AD from Loomis um, at a Denny's on our way, and and I think you know probably thirty minutes in, he was like, "All right, we're good. We're we're, we're like." If you can be here, uh, you know, Sunday night or whatever it was, like, you know, we're, we're, we're all set. We're going to get you rolling. So, um, so that just kind of, just kind of fell on my lap and it was, I was in a, you know, kind of right place, right time situation. And, um, and so that was, you know, that was an interesting year. It got me back into coaching and, and it was probably a really good thing because like I hadn't thought basketball in that way in a little bit. So it, it challenged me to to start thinking as a coach again, like how to how to run a team, what do we want to run, what what fits for these guys, um, you know. But like when I started, like we probably had a week before we were going to be playing a game. Like they had practice for a week, and then they were off for like four <laughs> or five days for Thanksgiving, and then we had another week, and then we were playing games. So like there was no time to really you know plan, prepare, or figure out figure out the roster or any of that stuff. Um, so it was you know it was a it was a somewhat challenging year, but it was a good learning year for me. Um, I enjoyed it and I was planning on coming back. They actually offered me a spot, um, in their admissions department. It was going to be like a part-time, like two to three day a week position where I would help out with, with, you know, admissions responsibilities. And then I could continue to coach. Um, but I could also continue to run basketball. Um, you know, cause I just, that was the one thing it was like, I, I, my wife and I didn't really want to move onto, you know, a campus cause they did offer me a full-time spot in admissions there too, but we just didn't want to, like, we had a good situation where we we're living. We didn't want to move onto the campus. Right. So we decided just to do the part-time thing for, you know, for the next year, <clears throat> excuse me. And then, um, it was probably like June, late June, early, early July when Western New England opened up. And again, very similar. Like I knew all the administration at Western New England. And Western New England, for me, it, like it's a really special place. My dad went to Western New England. My uncle was the football coach at Western New England for probably 14, 15 years. So like I grew up on that campus. I grew, that's where I like I would do a ton of workouts there. He would let me in the weight room. Um, so like I had a lot of history and, and, and fond memories there. Um, but also I, I got to know all the administration, the, the athletic director, the assistant AD, um, the facilities manager, because I was running a ton of events at Western New England. So when that job opened up, I was like, geez, this is, this is a great, like, I really believe this is a great job. You know, I think this is a gold mine. Like it's, it, it's something that hasn't been super successful. Um, so that, so the, the previous coach was also the AD. Um, and, and he, you know, he was just wearing too many hats. He was trying to, you know, run an athletic department plus coaching, you know, a, a men's college basketball team. And I think it just became too much for him. So that's when he stepped down from coaching and he was just going to focus on being the AD. Um, and then I, then, you know, crazy situation for him. He, he, he had some medical issues. So when, when I ended up starting there, he was like on disability. And I think, you know, my first year there, he was probably only in like, probably two or three months out of that time because he had some, just had some medical issues. And then he ended up stepping away from, you know, from Western Oregon as the AD and he had, um, ended up getting healthy and then taking another AD job somewhere else. So, um, anyhow, I got, I got a little sidetracked, but, um, so yeah, when the, when the Western New England job opened up, like I just, I just knew it was a great opportunity. And, and like I said, I had every intention of going back to Loomis. Um, but you know, my, my, Ultimately, I, I loved the idea of co- being at the college level, coaching there, and and trying to build that program up because I just thought it was a I thought it was a really good opportunity. So, what was the biggest adjustment as a first time collegiate head coach? I'm sure there's a bunch of things that were a challenge right off the bat. But when you think back to that time, what are some things that you knew you had to take care of? Some things that were important that you had to get off to a good start as a first time head coach. Yeah, I mean, you know, the timing was obviously not great because you know the 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 recruiting cycle had kind of came and went, you know. So by the time I started, it was almost the end of July. Um, so you know, you're 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 walking into a, a job where the students are going to be arriving in about three weeks. Um, your roster is your roster. I was able to get one player who happened to be a really good player for us. Um, I was able to get one player in August. So you know, I I think looking back on it, like I, I'm, I'm sure I, I know my head was spinning. I know my head was spinning at the time. Um, 
but looking back on it, I think the, the biggest challenge and the biggest surprise for me, like sliding into that position as a, as a, as a division three head college coach is just how many hats you have to wear. Like you're not, you're, you're not coaching just basketball. Like, you know, the, the, the academic side of things, you know, getting, getting the guys, you know, organized for study halls, um, the fundraising aspect of things, you know, connecting with alumni, alumni, alumni days, um, a lot of the things that were being done already on campus with other sports. I'm like, oh yeah, you guys are doing that and you guys are doing that. So you have to like, you have to learn the, 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 you know, the, the community there and like kind of what's the norm, what's not, um, you know, there was just, there was just so many things like we, our budget was just nothing, you know, nothing like I was used to when I was at Brandeis. So, so we, so we had to be creative with how we got things done and, and what we could offer our student athletes. Um, learning, you know, learning the academic standards and how the financial aid process worked, um, was much different, you know, like Brandeis was basically a full need school. So, you know, if you, if you qualified for full need, they would meet a hundred percent of it. Um, our situation at Western New England is like we we gap financial aid, so we're not we're not going to meet full need. Um, we'll give a portion of it, you know. So there was just a, there's just a lot of different, you know. What what are the academic uh, requirements and and you know what kind of kids you can get in and what kind of kids you can't? Where you got to recruit from, you know. So it just it just takes time, right? It just it just takes time to figure out like how to build the program and what like what's good what's gonna you know, what's going to be more beneficial with the time that you spend, you know, just being very focused and intentional with how you try to run your program. That took a, it really took a couple of years to try to figure out the best ways. And that's why I feel so, I feel awful for like, you know, when there's division one coaches who are high pressure jobs and like, you know, you get, you get three years and, and guys are, you know, people are calling for your head. Right. You're getting bounced. You know, yeah, it's just exactly. It, it take. I think it takes three years and, and uh, you know, it's just, it takes three years to really figure out like the type of kid that you can recruit and the type of kid that might be successful at your school. Cause every school is unique. So, um, well, and all the things that you're talking about, right. Are things that are off the floor. I mean, you're not yes. even talking about yes. at this point, we have, we haven't mentioned anything about what it takes to be successful on the basketball court. We're just talking about you and your adjustment to being able to, as you said, wear all those different hats and figure out all those different pieces and how they fit together and how they make sure that, they do what they're supposed to do to help your program to get where you want it to go. So, I mean, if that process is taking three years and then you're talking about, Hey, I'm also a first time head coach. I got to figure this thing out on the basketball court too. And obviously I think the first place where you start up to me, there's always two things when I think about how do you start a program? One, the first part is how do you build a culture? And then two, at the college level, how do you recruit? So let's touch on those two things. Maybe let's start with the recruiting piece of it. Obviously, that first year, you didn't have much of an opportunity to go out and recruit, but just talk about over the course of your tenure, how have you gone about and approached your recruiting? What kind of kid are you looking for? Obviously, there's a certain level of talent and skill that a kid has to have, but from maybe an intangible standpoint or some things that really fit into your program, what kind of kid, what kind of player are you looking for on the recruiting trail? Yeah, you know, that's that's kind of like a, it's, it's kind of like a moving target, you know, it's it's a it's a revolving door in, in a sense that like, I think it changes and it kind of changes based on your current roster. It changes based on, you know, kind of your, your own experiences. Like what, what, what has it been like lately for you? And, you know, it's not, it's Western Orleans, not a place where you can identify the kid that you want and know that you're going to, you know, like maybe you identify four or five kids that kind of have similar um, character traits and, and skill sets and all that stuff. And you're like, okay, we're going to get one of these four or five guys. Um, it's, it's not that cut and dry because, you know, you have the financial piece, you have the academic side of things. Um, I think you have to cast a little bit of a wider net and you have to be very flexible, adaptable, um, and willing to change as a coach. Um, we've, we've been small, we've been big, we've been physical, we've been quick, we've been, you know, like we've had kind of like the full gamut of different types of players. And my thought process is like, well, right away it was, you know, we got to get better talent. Okay. So my first year, I think we brought in 10 guys <clears throat> and, um, you know, I think six of them ended up making it all the way through graduating. Um, you know, and there's always a little bit of attrition at the division three level, you know, like there's just, there's going to be guys that for whatever reason decide not to play anymore, whether they, you know, fall kind of fall out of the love of the game or they can't afford it anymore. Or they struggle academically. There's, you know, you just, I just think there's always a little bit of turnover that, that occurs. <clears throat> so, you know, the first year we brought in 10 guys and then, you know, I think we, we increased our talent level, but when we, when we took some of those guys or there might've been, 
a little bit more risk than we would like because maybe they came with, you know, with some, you know, some question marks or some baggage there. Um, you know, and I think, I think that first year though, it was just like, okay, we got to get better players. We got to get better talent. Once we do that, then we can start to really kind of prioritize, you know, the type of kid that we really want to try to get here. Um, you know, but when you recruit a kid and they're playing for you, they're playing for you for four years. And that's, that's a long time, you know? And when you go, when oh, really? you you know, when you start, when you, when you realize that you're like, okay, that's going to change the type of kid that we want to get, you know, like we want to get guys that we really want to be around every day for four years. Um, because it's a long time and you spend a lot of days, a lot of hours together. Um, there's going to be good days. There's going to be bad days. There's going to be good moods. There's going to be bad moods. So, you know, you, you got to, you really are taking the good with the bad with a player and, so as I, you know, again, like a lot of it was a learning process for me. Um, so as I got to, you know, start to like really, you know, get comfortable with how I'm building my program and kind of go through a year and two years of, of those experiences, you know, you start to, you did try to start focusing more on kids that have high character. I'm very, you know, we're, we're, we're adamant as a staff about seeing kids play in high school before we make a decision on them. Um, because, I've, I think I've learned the hard way a little bit that like you see a kid play in AAU and you see one side of them. Um, but when you see a kid play in a high school game, um, there's a, there's a lot more that there's a lot more adversity that can come up. There's a lot more pressure. Um, how do, how do kids respond to that? How do, um, you know, how, how do they respond to their coaches getting on them? How do they respond to a team scouting them a certain way? Um, you know, I think, and, and unfortunately, it, it can be later in the recruiting process for us. Um, so you're you're kind of putting yourself at risk of potentially not getting a kid that you might think is talented enough. But I think it helps to answer a lot of the questions that that you might end up ultimately finding out about later on. Like if you have a kid for four years and you only take them after watching a showcase or an AAU tournament or something like that. Um, you know, it's really and, hard, man. It's hard. It's it, hard. It is the timing. The timing's not great. You know, especially for the Division three level because for the most part, like right now, right, we're still, we're still trying to solidify our senior class for next year's freshmen, you know? So we're still recruiting 24s and, you know, we're, we've seen, for the most part, we've seen all the guys that we're on pretty heavy in person now. So we have a really good feel for the guys that we want to get. Um, but like, I'm, I'm paying attention to mom and dad and stands, you know, like, is right. that, is that a family that we want to ha have around and, and be with for the next four years? Um, you know, you, you, you have to look at all aspects of that stuff now and, you know, we've had some kids that have been difficult to coach. And it, again, it kind of comes back to that same point of like four years is a long time and, and it affects your culture. It affects your team. And um, I think it's much easier to recruit culture than it is to try to mold culture. Um, but again, it's just not, it's not something that is so cut and dry at our level. Like we, sometimes we, we strike out on the, the kids that are, you know, for the top four or five on our board in a, in a certain position or a certain need. So then, you know, do we, take a kid that might be a little bit more of a risk um, to try to fill that spot that we have a void in or a need in, or do we, do we wait? You know, it's, it's a tough thing. It's a really tough thing, especially with not having scholarships. So. Absolutely. Yeah. I can completely understand. You get to that point where, as you said, everybody's waiting and this year it's even doubly difficult because the FAFSA is so delayed. So everybody doesn't even know what kind of package you're going to be able to offer them in any way, shape or form. So yeah. then it's, uh, everybody's kind of, everybody's kind of in a waiting game schools and coaches are in a waiting game and, and players are in a waiting game. And I know that my son's sort of in that same position. We're just sitting around and he's going to be a division three player. And there's a bunch of schools that are interested and a bunch of schools that he's interested in, but it's hard to compare apples to apples when you have no idea what the final cost of the tuition is going to be at any of the places. So it's, it makes it, it makes it challenging on both sides because obviously the schools are waiting to hear what his decision is going to be. And right. clearly he wants to make a decision and figure it out. So it's, it's tough. I know it, the, t the timing aspect of division three recruiting is really, really challenging. Cause I like, we have a couple of kids right now that I can tell are, are very close to saying that they want to come. And I'm like, is he the top guy that we want right now? Or, or do we, you know, right. what, like if he calls me tomorrow and says, coach, I'm, I'm ready to right. say yes. Right. If he says yes. Yeah. I, I know Johnny, you know, is better and, and, and fits us better and, and is the right fit for us, but he's probably a month away, you know? So if I, if I say, Hey, I appreciate the call and, 
you know, something's changed or whatever, you know, whatever, you know, th- story I, I were to give them, like what, you know, then you risk not getting either one, you know? So right. it's hard. It's, it's a very, it's like the time, the time and it, and, it, and it comes at you quick, you know, it's this time of year where you're, you know, and, and some of the guys that we're going after, like they're, they're hoping to get scholarships still, you know? And, and, those, and I think to be really successful at the division three level, you, you got to get some steals. You got to get some guys that are, that are probably scholarship level players and, they fall through the cracks for whatever reason it may be. Um, and certainly now I think with the, with the current recruiting landscape, that's probably happening a lot more now than it ever has. Um, you know, division two level guys dropping our level. So, um, but like yeah. everything that I, every, like, and I tell my staff this, I tell my players this when we practice every day. And, and like, if, if we're having a, you know, maybe a rough day, like everything that, that we're trying to do is to be able to play and beat the top teams that we play against during the year. And like, you know, in our conference, Nichols has, <clears throat> outside of this year, Nichols has won the conference tournament and been in the NCAAs, I think, you know, the last seven years. Um, and this was a very unique year where us and Nichols both got upset in the semifinals. Uh, we were the one and the two. They were the one. We were the two. And um, but like that's like we're constantly saying, can this type of player beat Nichols? You know, that's that's right. that's, that's yeah. the measure. That's the measuring stick, you know, and they're for sure. And he does a great job. Like he's. You know he's he's got he he has some really good young talent, but he's also he also hits the transfer portal and he's got Division One players transferring in and it's it's just you know so like we're kind of like you know I was looking at their lineup and we we're scouting for them like they they got basically five Division One guys on the on, on the floor right now you know and yeah so that's yep. that's ultimately what you're competing against so absolutely and I mean I think that's true when you look at any level right you want to be able to if you're going to compete you got to be able to have players on your roster who are probably capable of playing a level above where they are and that's a tough needle to thread it is when you start talking about recruiting and figuring it out the timing as you said where okay do i say yes to this kid while i'm waiting on this one who might be a little bit better and a little bit better fit and then as you said do i lose both of them it's a man that is again it's not an enviable position and just like when when you call for our pre-podcast call and you're like i'm in the gym recruiting i'm out on the road and <laughs> right obviously Obviously, from a Division three stand standpoint, you know you have a lot more freedom than than guys at the higher levels to be out and be able to watch games, which I'm sure in some ways is a blessing, in some ways is a curse, right? You, <laughs> yeah, you have, sure. you have you have that you have that access, but you also can't uh, you also can't say, well, can't get out today because it's it's illegal for me to be out there. You can kind of be out there whenever you whenever you want to be. So, um, you know, obviously there's there's good and bad to to that part of it. So once you get these guys on campus and you've got them on your team. What do you think are the keys to the success that you've been able to have on the basketball floor? What have you done in terms of building your program? The key one or two things that you think have led to the success that you've had? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think I think the biggest thing, and, and it's hard, but I think the biggest thing is is for guys to to walk in and, and understand that they're a part of something that's much much bigger than them, themselves right now. Um, so it's kind of like, uh, and I talk about during our recruiting process, um, but it, it's it's an element of like, okay, now now you have to leave your ego at the door, and and everything that we do now is 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 about the program, you know, every, like every decision we make, every shot we take, um, you know, every time we're either jogging or sprinting back on defense, like ultimately you're affecting the other fourteen, fifteen guys in the roster. Um, so we really try to hammer home like that aspect of, of, of the, we above me and, and leaving your ego at the door. And, you know, you could go down the line and probably say, you know, 12 of our 16 or 17 guys, whatever it was, you know, were the best players on their high school team. But now it's a collection of that, you know, and you're, you're no different than, than your teammate that's sitting right next to you in terms of what, where you're coming from and what you've experienced up to this point. But now it's, it's about making those sacrifices that, that are going to be, Ultimately, you're going to help our program and our team um, have more success. So, we really try to we, we we stress that a lot. We talk about it a lot. We talk about you know team success will lead to individual success. You know, like it, it's funny this year. Um, you know, last year we had four guys make all conference second second uh, second place finish in the conference, and this year we we dealt with a just a boatload of injuries and and you know just guys kind of confidence fluctuating from you know up and down because they're dealing with some of these injuries so we didn't have the year that you know that i knew we were capable of but you know we still finished in second place and we still had three guys that made all conference and you know and i and i was worried this year because i was like you know i I stress it all the time like 
team success is going to lead to individual success. And I felt like this year, I'm like, we're going to like kind of, kind of be splitting our votes this year because we were very, very balanced. Um, we had a bunch of guys that averaged between like 10 and 14 points a game. So I was kind of worried that like they were all going to kind of take each other's votes and like that was going to, you know, fly in the wind of the, of my message that I give my guys all the time, you know? Um, but it ended up working out okay from, from that award standpoint or whatever you want to say, you know, but, um, you know, I, I do think there's, there's a lot of truth to that stuff, you know, and, and they have to be willing to sacrifice their own personal goals for, for what we're trying to build as a team. And we really buy in on the, on the defensive end. Um, you know, I think our guys have, especially this current group has, have really grasped, um, how, how our system works on the defensive end and what we're trying to do and what, where we're trying to force the ball and opportunities that are going to exist. Um, you know, so like the last two years, I think we've, we've kind of been one or either first or second place, um, for points allowed and field goal percentage and, and some of those key stats within our conference and even ranked nationally in some of them last year. Um, so I think there's, you know, the guys are doing a good job of buying in on the things that we stress. You know, um, we do a lot of work culturally. We, um, you know, we, we have, you know, we have uh, kind of like our standards that we set and we try to, we try to mold those from year to year. Um, we try to remind our guys of those standards, you know, and kind of everything that we do. Um, you know, there's certainly times of the year where we'll, we'll have some lapses, but for the most part, the guys do a really good job of, of buying in and holding each other accountable for that stuff and, um, and kind of walking the walk with it. So, um, yeah, so I think we, you know, I, and, and I'm really trying to get to the point now and, and I think we're, we're at a, in a good spot where the guys, the guys coach themselves, right? They hold, they hold each other to the standards. They, it's, it's not something where the coaches have to be the ones enforcing it. You know, like I think the guys are doing a good job of, of being the ones that are, are holding the, holding each other to those standards now because they know what the expectations are and they know what the coaching staff wants. And, and they, all, they also know some of the things that, that they stressed as really important to them early in the year. Um, and you know, we got some experienced guys now that have been with us for two, three years and, and some going on four with a, with a COVID year next year. So, um, you know, I think we're from that standpoint, we're in a pretty good spot too. Absolutely. I want to wrap up with one final two part question. So part one is when you look ahead over the next year or two, what do you see as being your biggest challenge? And then second part of the question is when you think about what you get to do every day, what's your biggest joy? So your biggest challenge and then your biggest joy. So I think as a coach, it's probably natural, like where you're, you're never content in your current state. You know, you're, you're always worried about the future. Um, and I, I can't say like, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a good core of our guys back next year. Um, I feel good about our talent level and I feel good about the potential for next year's team, but like, I'm already worried and concerned about two, two years from now, three years from now, four years from now, you know? So that's really what keeps me up at night is like making sure that like, I, you know, I want to want to continue to compete at this high level, you know, and, and, you know, be, com, you know, fighting for a conference championship every year and, and, and potentially making the NCAA tournament. Like I, I really hope our guys get a chance to experience that. I know how challenging it is and how, um, how, you know, how competitive it is, but like, I just really hope that our guys get a chance to experience that in, in the coming years. And, uh, you know, so it's just kind of maintaining and, and, and continue, but even, but even getting better, like it's not just maintaining, it's getting, it's continually getting better. And so I think the recruiting aspect of things is, is going to, is a constant challenge that never goes away. Um, so that's, that's probably what I would say for the challenge. Um, biggest joy is, is I'm doing, doing what's something I love to do. You know, I, I love being around the guys. I love the locker room. I love, um, the preparation and, and the recruiting aspect of things that you, I, I have a job that like, you know, it, it's a very special job. It's a very unique job and there's a lot of demands. There's a lot of time away. There's a lot of sacrifices, but ultimately it's, it's something that I absolutely love doing. Um, I'm at a great place where our administration is super supportive. And, um, so, you know, I think, I think from all of that stuff, like they, they provides me with a ton of joy and I, and I, and I'm passionate, I'm super passionate about it. I'm just as motivated today as I was nine years ago when I started. Um, so those are the two things. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, the, the tough thing with all of this is, is the family aspect of it, you know, like three young yep. daughters, you know, that's, that's always, that's always kind of in the back of my mind that, you know, you're missing aspects of, of your girl's, um, childhood and, and sporting events and, and certain things like that. So that's the, that's something that's always, always challenging in this profession. So. Um, you know, you try to, you try to find as, as much balance as you can and, and be there as much as you can, but 
um, there's there's obviously going to be things that you miss. So it, it can that can be difficult at times. But that is definitely one of the biggest challenges, and mm-hmm. definitely something that's not easy to do. But hey, you're getting your girl some good workouts in and bumping her and trying to get her some pickup <laughs> basketball experience. So that's you're you're doing you're doing something right over there, trying, Colin. Trying what I can. All right. All right, before we get out, I want to give you a chance to share how people can connect with you, whether you want to share email, social media, website, whatever you feel comfortable with. And then after you do that, I will jump back in and wrap things up. Cool. Um, yeah, all my info is on, on the Western Illinois uh, Athletics website. Um, so you can find my email and office number there. I am also on Twitter. Uh, I think it's CTAB44, CTABB44. So feel free to give a follow there. Um, but feel free to reach out as well if, uh, if, if you'd like to. And I appreciate the opportunity, Mike. This is great. Absolutely. Colin, cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule tonight to jump on with us. Truly appreciative. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job. A professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies, and most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your Coaching Portfolio Guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com slash hoopheads to learn more. Thanks for listening to the Hoopheads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.